The best place to play fantasy football this summer is Underdog Fantasy. Their best ball mania tournament has $10 million in total prize money. And the best part is you just draft your fantasy football team, and that's it. There's no waivers, no trades, no in-season management. Underdog gives you the best score each week of the season, and the highest scores at the end of the year win. The champion of best ball mania last year drafted in June, so there's no time like the present to, to join Underdog and take a shot in a million-dollar draft. Plus, Underdog is going to double your first deposit up to $100 when you sign up with promo code PFF. Also, if you play 10 of those dollars using promo code PFF, you get a free PFF subscription. So what are you waiting for? Head to Underdog Fantasy now. Go to the App Store, play $10 with code PF, PFF, and draft your best ball mania team today. All right, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Monday edition of the podcast. Not a lot going on in the NFL right now, and I feel like I've led with that a few times, but I'm serious this time. If you looked at Peter King's Football Morning in America column this week, he basically handed it over to Al Michaels and Kirk Herbstreet, and it was short and done with pretty quickly. And then we have, of course, a a little bit of a different situation this week with the national holiday for Juneteenth on Monday, which I think some companies, most companies are recognizing. I'm not sure what the PFF policy is on it, quite honestly, because we're kind of cranking year round uh, for the most point and holidays, weekends, whatnot. Uh, everything comes secondary to the NFL schedule, and I'm sure people still are looking for their podcasts out there. So happy Juneteenth to everyone out there, if that's how you talk about it. Uh, not quite sure, honestly. Now, uh, let's get into what we're going to talk about on this podcast, though. Luckily, I have some good content for you. I'm going to delve a little bit more into some evergreen type of stuff for this one because the news cycle is a little bit slower now. I do have one topical thing going on, and that would be going over an article by three of the younger uh, interns at PFF where they're looking into perfectly covered plays. Really interesting piece here. And it builds on the fact that for the last few years, we've been going back and grading every single coverage player and looking at them individually, whether or not they are targeted. In the past, we just gave everyone zeros on their grade, so like a neutral grade if they were not targeted in coverage, and then actually graded them if they were. So the fact that we have this new data, it opens up a whole nother spectrum of information and analysis and insight that we can get off of it. Great piece there that they put out today. There will be follow-up pieces, but I'm going to go through some of the, the takeaways for that. So that's a maybe not topical, but it is something that is happening this week that you can go and get. And I might as well just mention now, you can go and get that 25% uh, off with promo code UNEXPECTED. If you want to use that, get this lock article content. I have my breakout wide receiver content that's coming out. And just did something on Jalen Waddell, which I thought was pretty interesting today. And we'll co go forward with Devontae Smith and others uh, from the second year sophomore class, a big wide receiver class from the 2021 draft, now going into their sophomore season. So that's going to be a big part of it. The second part, the second segment of the show is going to be a back to school segment where I'm going to look at the pros and cons of a bunch of different quarterback metrics i think it can get very confusing out there when there are traditional stats passer rating yards per attempt and those sorts of uh traditional efficiency stats pff passing grades epa cpoe qbr dvoa it's all over the place it's alphabet soup for all of these different things i'm going to try to define it a little bit better try to point out what the missing context may be, what may be over and undervalued in all these different measures, which give you a better idea and a better uh, frame for how to use each one to, order to evaluate quarterback play, but then also use multiple ones to get to quarterback play. And the last uh, segment I'm going to have today is a stick to sports segment, which I haven't done in a while, where I tackle a subject outside of the sports realm. But this is actually a stick to sports segment about Stick to sports. It's a little meta. I'll get into all the details later about exactly what that is. Okay, let's first go into this article. 
that I'm talking about. And again, this the title of the article, if you go to pff.com, it's called The Effect of Perfectly Covered Plays on NFL Offenses. Again, 2019, 2020, 2021, we have the data, every single coverage player being graded separately, whether or not they are their the player they are covering is being targeted on this play. So Eric Eager helped write this up, and the the interns who are working on this, uh, Arjun Menon, Haley English, and Judah Fortgang, they have been putting together this stuff during the summer. You should follow them all on Twitter. Um, they've been putting together a lot of this stuff to help figure out what sort of insights that we can get when looking at whether plays are perfectly covered or not, or the degree to which they are perfectly covered. So just some some baseline numbers here. Perfectly covered def, um, is defined by every single coverage player who is assigned to a particular receiver on this does not have a negative grade. So no negative grades for, for these players. And coverage... From a macro perspective, coverage is what we would call a weak link system. So there's a strong link versus weak link. Uh, before I get to coverage, I'll talk about the two that go against each other at the line of scrimmage as an example to what this means, strong link versus weak link. So in order to protect the quarterback properly, none of the offensive linemen can fail on a particular play. If any of the offensive linemen give up a pressure, now of course there are double teams, there are some linemen who aren't purely engaged, but at least when you think about from from the tackle's perspective, if either one of those is giving up a pressure, then there is a pressure on that play. So it's a weak link system. You're only as good as your weakest link. We've heard that saying before. That's how it applies here. An offensive line is only as good as its weakest link. That's an oversimplification, of course. You're not only as good as your weakest link. But if you have a Hall of Fame level left tackle and then your right tackle is below replacement level, you're going to have some issues there. They are going to roll their best pass rusher over to the right tackle side and he is going to get he's going to give up a lot of pressure on that side and no matter how effective that left tackle is, he cannot prevent pressure from coming in away from where he is on that play. It neutralizes some of the value of that left tackle. Weak link, strong link. Flip over to the other side of the ball. Yes, there are defensive linemen working in conjunction, there's blitzing, there's other things going on, but generally it's the flip side here. If you have a really really great pass rusher, who can get to the quarterback, let's say on the edge where you're not going to get double teamed as much, can get to the quarterback consistently. Even if you have a really poor pass rusher on the other side, it's not as big of a detriment because there are so many plays where that great pass rusher is providing, is able to get to the quarterback all by himself without anyone else's help. He is the strong link there. He's able to... uh, to put pressure on that quarterback, and it matters a little bit less that you don't have a strong link somewhere else. Okay, let's flip it to coverage. The weak link is going to be coverage because a quarterback can throw it to any of a number of wide receivers, a number of targets out there, a number of players running routes. So if there is one coverage blown, one poor coverage job, if the quarterback can find that player, which is, you know, Contingent upon that, you can exploit that weak link no matter how good the coverage is on the other players. Again, the strong link being the wide receivers. If you have one dominant wide receiver who can get open, who can maybe align in certain ways to avoid double teams, as long as that player is continually getting open, if you have poorer players elsewhere, it isn't as detrimental of an effect. So the coverage only as good as your weakest link, the receiving core more so as good as your strongest link. To a degree. There's a little bit of a weak linkedness to receivers too. And Eric either Eager and others have done work to show how important the second and the tertiary options are on passing plays and their ability to get open. But again, we're going to simplify things in a in a bigger, broader spectrum. So looking at the weak link in the context of perfectly covered plays here. So if a play is not perfectly covered, so that would be if in at least one player 
has a negative impact, has a negative coverage grade on a particular play, the expected points added per play on those is about 0.3. The success rate is over 55%. The explosive play rate is over 11%, close to 12%. And that happens on about 62% of pass plays. On the other flip side of it, on the 38% of pass plays where there is perfect coverage, no one's negatively graded on that, the EPA per play flips to a negative 0.3 as opposed to a positive 0.3. So we're talking about on a per play basis losing 0 0.6, 0 0.7 points. The success rate goes down to 36%, so you still can be successful even on perfectly covered plays. The explosive play rate, though, that one drops way down, 2.6% versus 11.6% if it's not perfectly covered. And then, like I told you, this is happening about 40% of the time. It's about a 40-60 split between these. So it really gives a good measure here. There's different things that they'll show as far as the distribution of different outcomes, fewer incompletions, but much so where you're getting that driving, that huge value on EPA is through the big plays you get if there is a negative grade in coverage. The blown coverage, essentially, like that. The ability to exploit that weak link is what's very, very, very important for a big play for offenses. And that's why having that consistency in coverage on defense is such a huge benefit rather than just having one lockdown corner and maybe other guys who don't quite know what they're doing. If they blow something, your defense gets blown up. So going further into this, we, we drop a bit further. There's, there's information about play action. There's information about how many players have blown a coverage on a particular play. You can look at all that again, pff.com, promo code unexpected. Check it out. Um, but it also has the defenses that have the highest percentage of perfectly covered plays by season. So again, we're looking at 2019, 2020, 2021, and these are ranked by the best coverage units with their ability to have perfectly covered plays over this three-year time span. The LA Rams are number one. The Buffalo Bills are number two. Denver Broncos, number three. Philadelphia Eagles, maybe a little surprisingly. They don't have much in their defensive backfield uh, coming into this season. Number four. And the San Francisco 49ers, number five. Now, after that, also some ones like the Bucks, the Saints, the Colts, the Chiefs, uh, the commanders, now commanders, and the Titans kind of round out the top 10 there of these different of these different plays. And when we start to look at the quarterback information here, and this one is a little dicey. I'm not quite sure we should read too much into it. But if you look at the quarterbacks who are the best at perfectly covered plays, so deriving value on perfectly covered plays, Patrick Mahomes is number one. Not a huge surprise there. Aaron Rodgers, Deshaun Watson, Tua shows up there, which is pretty interesting. Trevor Lawrence shows up there. Pretty interesting. And then the next group here, Josh Allen, Dak Prescott, Lamar Jackson, Jalen Hurts is another interesting name there. Now, why would some of these names be at the top that you wouldn't necessarily expect? Well, perfectly covered plays, there are a number of different outcomes you can have on any pass play, including perfectly covered plays. But... Let's look at what, what the results are on these types of plays. So again, all different plays when it's perfectly covered, you're losing about a third of a point. If you throw into perfect coverage and 83% of the time that's happening, you're throwing it into there, you're trying to complete a pass, it's about negative 0.22. So it's a little bit better as long as you get the ball out of your hand because every sack that you're taking in perfect coverage is minus 1.8 points. I mean, that's a massive negative. That's losing two points almost for your team when you're taking a sack there versus only losing 0.2 points. So a tenth of the value loss if you're able to get the ball out of your hand and at least target someone. Now, another huge effect here, and this is what's driving guys like Jalen Hurts, Josh Allen to a degree, Lamar Jackson, Patrick Mahomes, who's a great scrambler, Scrambling is the one most positive outcome on these perfectly covered plays. You're gaining about a third of the point every single time you scramble. So again, if you can avoid a sack and instead get out and scramble and make some hay there on a perfectly covered play, if you have the ability to do that, we're talking about more than two points that you're gaining for your team on one single play. 
And the last thing is a throwaway. So a throwaway is just an automatic incompletion. It's about a negative 0.8. So you're still saving about a point if you can just get rid of the ball and throw it away versus taking a sack. And that's why I'm always harping on different systems, including our grading, perceptions that NFL media may have. If you're looking at a play and you're saying, oh, it's perfectly covered, so the guy took a sack, we can't blame the quarterback, versus it's perfectly covered, the quarterback was smart enough to just flick it out at the last second and throw an incompletion, that's saving his team a point. That's hugely significant, hugely significant over the course of a game where once you get one, two, three, four points, if you're able to do that one, two, three, four times rather than take sacks, it's giving your it's giving your team a much, much better chance to win. So that's something to think about is in these perfectly covered plays, quick instincts, quickly getting rid of the ball, either give your receiver a chance to catch it because interceptions are actually not that much higher on these perfectly covered plays. Give your receiver a chance to catch it scramble or throw the ball away all hugely impactful to the upside versus taking a sack now if you look at some of the worst quarterbacks in these situations justin herbert is a guy who's down near the bottom which is a little bit surprising and i think it shows that because he has high efficiency overall that the teams he's been playing against have not been so good in coverage in fact if we're going to go through the worst teams over the last few years in coverage, the Raiders are down near the bottom there. So they're probably one of those teams that really drives down that amount. And the fact that teams like the Chargers and you know the Chiefs and others have been able to derive a lot of value going against them. But I guess Herbert was probably the most surprising guy you see down near the bottom. Also, Derek Carr, Kirk Cousins, Mac Jones, Philip Rivers, Teddy Bridgewater, Ryan Fitzpatrick. Bridgewater and Fitzpatrick can scramble a bit. The rest of those guys, you know, not nearly as much. And it really gives an indication of how much the floor is raised when you can scramble. That's why I talk about running quarterbacks a lot as floor raisers, because in the worst circumstances, a perfectly covered play here, you see how much of a difference how much is pushing up your Jalen Hurts, your Lamar Jackson. Your Dak Prescott, who can scramble, your Josh Allen, your Patrick Mahomes, even Rodgers does pretty good scrambling, Deshaun Watson, and so on. All these guys are getting pushed up quite a bit. Well, some of them are great all the time, but getting pushed up quite a bit here with the ability to scramble. That's why the running quarterback raises the floor outcome for a lot of these guys here. Now, the, the perfect statue, Tom Brady, he falls in about the middle of the league on these on these types of plays. So there's going to be a lot more work on this going forward from Eric, from everyone else to flesh out a lot of the details here. I'm excited to see what else we can we can find from this because, again, this is new data that we did not have before going on a play-by-play -play basis to really be able to figure it all out. And with that, we're going to have tons of stuff to discuss going forward into the future. All right, now let's hit our back-to-school segment. Back to school. Hey, boys, here's a couple of pens in case you learn how to write. Okay. All right. So that was a clip from 1982, I want to say. Uh, film Back to School starring Ronnie Dangerfield. Excellent film. Sure, sure you get canceled for a lot of the content that's in there nowadays, but I suggest you check it out any anyway. The Triple Indy, just an amazing piece of uh, of cinema right there. Uh, we're going to talk quarterback stats. Okay. I'm going to go through, I would say least to most advanced, maybe quarterback stats, but also try to get an idea of what's being left out of some, the good, the bad, the ugly in these different stats. So let's start the simplest thing possible. Traditional volume stats. X number of touchdowns. Did they get 30 touchdowns? Did someone end up with 40 touchdowns? Did they get three touchdowns in a particular game? Did they get 300 yards in a particular game? How many yards on the season? Now, all of these stats, quarterback wins. You can even throw that into it. All of these stats have some use. There is a correlation between throwing for more yards and being a good quarterback. There is a correlation between throwing for a lot of touchdowns and being a good quarterback. There is a correlation between winning games and being a good quarterback. It's just not focusing on the key. It's missing the context from how many times you throw the ball. What is vastly more correlated with 
how efficient in winning and strength of an offense is on a per play basis what you are doing on an efficiency basis what you are doing this was probably the first thing even we're talking about going back in the olden days to you know what Virgil Carter and others in the hidden game of football were talking about is you have to first be able to figure out efficiency versus volume differentiating those two some sports like baseball, when even you looked at maybe not the most advanced stat, but something like uh, batting average kind of has that ingrained into the way that you would view different players there. Football, not nearly as much. Basketball, definitely not nearly as much. You're looking at you know shot attempts, field goal percentage somewhat, but there's a huge focus on basketball on is some guy a 20 and 10 guy a triple double things like that those raw raw numbers as opposed to what people are doing on a an efficiency basis it works a little bit better for for basketball because you're going to have a certain number of possessions the top players play about the same number of possessions football not quite as well because you have different pace differentials and then you have a run and pass mix which shifts significantly depending upon how a team wants to allocate that and to spread that out uh, between those two functions of offense. And it shifts dramatically at the end of the game, in particular the fourth quarter, based upon the score and whether you're up or not in a situationally, whether you're deciding to run or whether you're deciding to pass. So a lot of different things going on there. Not all bad, but we have so many better options for looking at quarterback play beyond volume although volume can be used in conjunction with some of these other stats okay the second thing i'll mention here is passer rating passer rating it's one of the most complicated formulas you're ever going to see in your entire life (laughs) for how for how they come up with this thing it's about four different subsets of a type of efficiency it's then rounded into combining them together multiplied by some other arbitrary numbers and then it comes out to a scale of 0 to 158.3. So a perfect passer rating. You'll hear that a lot. So-and-so has a perfect passer rating as 158.3. And the weird thing about the perfect passer rating, always for me, is how can you have a perfect passer rating and then have incompletions? You know, like, or or not averaging uh, infinite yards per pass attempt. Like, there's a wide range from even how you can get to a perfect passer passer rating in here. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll start with the benefits here. I don't want to just completely trash passer rating the entire time. What are the benefits of passer rating? Well, familiarity. If you say someone has a 90 passer rating, we kind of have an idea of what that means. Having experience with the talk about passer rating for a long time. And 100 passer rating is around average. It's not exactly average. I think 93, 92, 93 was an, is an average type of number for the league generally. But we're close to 100. So if you're above 100, below 100, you get an idea of, okay, that's an average-ish sort of, sort of performance there. Now, the negatives here, again, impossibly difficult to calculate and to figure out what's going on there. Another huge negative for passer rating is sacks are not a part of passer rating. One of the most impactful parts of football is not a part of the calculation here. So passer rating is always going to be better for guys who take a lot of sacks. And it's also going to get quite a bit of enhancement from high completion percentage where that may not necessarily be the greatest thing there. Uh, So those are two pretty huge negatives, in my opinion, for something that's going to capture quarterback play when the the majority of the negativity of passing plays okay you're taking more negatives from sacks than you are from interceptions generally passing offices to exclude sacks from the calculation is just a real a real misfire in that sort of rating so you know we kind of want to fire passer rating into the sun but it has its benefits in mostly in the fact that it's been around and people can have some sort of intuitive understanding of it even though no one could calculate it to save their lives to figure out how that that calculation is actually made okay much more intuitive and i think useful stats that are still very simple are pure efficiency stats using yardage touchdowns interceptions sacks and number of attempts 
So the biggest one is going to be yards per attempt. That's the pure and simple passing yards divided by how many times someone throws the ball. It's intuitive. It gives you an idea of probably how aggressive someone is being to a degree, but it's really playing um, yards per reception versus completion percentage. So either one of those going up or down is going to move the yards per attempt. You can have a lower yards per reception, a higher completion percentage to get a higher yards per attempt. You can have a lower completion percentage, a higher yards per completion per reception, and that gets you to a higher yards per attempt too. It's those two forces working against each other that gets you to the ultimate thing that we care about on a passing play, which is how many yards you're gaining. Maybe not the only thing, but the biggest thing that we care about. Okay, an enhancement of that coming from PFR and from uh, Doug Drynan and the guys there was adjusted yards per attempt. That is adding touchdowns and interceptions, estimates of how much they're worth. So you're adding 20 yards um, for each touchdown and you're subtracting 45 yards for each interception. Again, these are estimates for how much they're worth based upon past performance and the effect of yardage on scoring. So an interception is, you know, two and a quarter times worse than a touchdown is positive according to this calculation. So you're adding that into the mix and then you're still dividing by the number of attempts. The third way you can look at this is you're also adding in negative sack yards. So for every yard that you're taking as a negative for sack, you're subtracting that from that same total after you have the total yards uh, passing adding 20 for each touchdown, subtracting 45 from each interception, and then subtracting the sack yards. And then you're dividing by the attempts plus sacks. So that's your total dropbacks, essentially, in that number. And that gives you probably the best simple efficiency number where you can get an idea, an intuitive idea of six yards per dropback when you're saying adjusted net yards per attempt. If the number is six, you're getting an idea, okay, each time we're they're dropping back the pass, not counting scrambles, that's basically what you should expect on that play. Now, the downside of this, but I said this is a good measure, it's a simple measure, you can go back in time a long, long distance. Sack numbers are a little bit iffy if you go back, uh, going back too far, but you can go back a very, very long time to have a comparable scale, it's intuitive. The, the, the bad side is it does not take context into equation. So a completion for a first down for three yards when you have two yards to gain is much, much different than a completion for three yards on first and 10 as far as the value that it adds. A sack losing five yards is much, much worse for the offense's ability to score points because of how tough it's going to be to get a first down than then a five-yard gain is good. In other words, those aren't equivalent. Those sack yards are really not equivalent to positive yards and how we look at it. And again, touchdowns and interceptions, contextually, an interception on third and 10 where you're, you're throwing an arm punt is a much different one than a pick six on, a, on an interception and vice versa, a touchdown where you're kind of stealing a touchdown from a running back, passing it in on a first and goal from the one is much less value than one where you're throwing it and getting it into the end zone from further away. So it doesn't have the context and the play-by-play, -play, down distance, score, situational advantage that you would have for expected points added, which we'll talk about later. All right, the next one I want to talk about, PFF passing grades. Company man here. I don't want to be too harsh on PFF passing grades. So PFF passing grades, every play, quarterback is graded between negative two and positive two. Anything a one or higher, we consider a quote unquote big time throw. Anything of a negative one or lower, a turnover worthy play. All of that is wrapped up in order to get a passer grade. Positives here, positives of passer grading. It is more focused on not just the result of the play, but the action of the quarterback. You could have a turnover-worthy play on a play that doesn't end up in a turnover, that might even end up in a reception, that might even end up in a big play. We would grade it negatively if it's a play that we said, reasonably, you should have expected to have a turnover on that play. On the flip side, you can make a great 
amazing pass down the field and it's dropped for what would have been a big time throw and a touchdown in the stat sheet. It's an incompletion in our grading. It's a big positive number, which is driving a high grade for that, for that game. So that's really what it's going to do. It's not a team stat as much as these other ones are. A lot of times you hear about expected points added, they'll say it's a team stat. Well, all of these are team stats in a way. You know, yardage is a team stat. Passing yards is a team stat. Touchdowns is a team stat. It's how many touchdowns the team is scoring on that play. Everyone's working together. Passer grades, PFF passing grades are trying to focus more on the quarterback. Can you completely detach the quarterback from other players on it, on his team? No. But if he takes a sack for holding on to the ball way, way too long versus a very, very quick sack, we're going to make a big differentiation on that and try to isolate on the quarterback. Problems, though. Now let's talk about some problems. Maybe earplugs to any uh, PFF higher-ups who may be listening to this, this podcast here. Problems. Calibration, I would say, is, the, is one thing. How much should a negative be versus a positive? How much does that reflect the true value of what's going on there? Are we properly crediting quarterbacks with things that they do that don't look that impressive but have a big impact on the game? Are we prop properly hitting quarterbacks on things like taking sacks when it looks like they didn't have much chance to get rid of the ball, but we've seen how much sacks are steady for quarterbacks over the seasons and how much of a quote unquote quarterback stat it is because it's much more related to the quarterback year over year than it is to the offensive line play. So that's, that's, that's one problem. I would say with passing grades. Another problem is many, many plays are just zeros. I think it's a good thing. If you can't properly differentiate, it's a good thing here where we just have, we, do, we go by 0.5s on this. So you're a positive 0.5, a 1, a 1.5, a 2. Very few 2s, very few 1.5s. There's some plus 1s. Ton of plus 0.5. So we have 0.5s and negative 0.5s. We have a lot of these. But then by and by far and away, I think it's 60% of plays or more. We're just giving quarterbacks a 0. So we're not differentiating a lot on these plays where we're like the quarterback executed their job. But there's a big difference between the quarterback executed their job and hit the guy perfectly in stride, which then leads to a huge play. But we might just say, oh, the quarterback did their job versus the quarterback did their job by lobbing the ball up for a wide open wide receiver who had to wait and then catch the ball and then ran in for a touchdown. You know, we're not going to give negatives on either one of those plays. We're probably not going to give positives on either one of those plays. So that ends up being Another issue with it is that just so many plays are graded zero where there's really a large range of outcome and a large range of skill that probably goes into those zero plays. The other thing I would say is that the ability to measure things outside of throws is difficult because we are trying to measure some decision making when it comes to holding on to the ball too long to take a sack, things like that, but mostly the grading is going to be about grading throws, not grading process, not grading how the, well they're reading the defense, not grading a bunch of things that are going to lead to value. They're going to come through in this in the other stat sheet, in your normal stat sheet, in your EPA, expected points added stat sheet, but are not necessarily going to flow through to grades. And we're going to give a much better grade to someone who is throwing the ball well and accurately and in the right spot, even if the process and the decision-making for how they got there may not be worth the grade that we're getting them, giving them for having a great throw or vice versa. You can have another player who has excellent, excellent process, maybe isn't the most accurate person after that process because of how qu quickly they're going through their reads, because of how they're, they're just flicking it in, uh, flicking off the pass at the last second, things like that. But they're, they're driving big results. So the EPA says good. The PFF passing grade says meh. And I think we're getting that a lot with guys uh, Patrick Mahomes is probably one of them where our grading is now consistently seeing him as much less than what his results are. And I think part of that is there is a lot that goes into his results that aren't just part of throwing the ball where he has shown, you know, not the greatest accuracy versus someone like Russell Wilson, but Russell Wilson probably has a much worse process um, and much worse ability to find, you know, players over the middle and throw it into other windows that could help enhance value, not take sacks. 
um, where it's not going to hurt him as much in our grades as it's going to hurt someone like Patrick Mahomes. Okay, sorry, sorry, PFF. I had to had to do you like that. Uh, next, I'm going to go into CPOE. So completion percentage over expected. We've seen this one a lot. It's going to be on a simple basis. Well, like you'll see with NFL faster or people who don't have tracking data, the simple basis is air yards, maybe location, whether you're throwing it to the middle or to the sidelines, and field position, things like that. We'll, we'll go into it, and it'll show – here, what your expected completion percentage would be versus what your actual completion percentage would be with the caveat that the further you throw the ball, the less likely it is to be completed. Uh, I think it's a good stat for accuracy. I think quarterbacks who are accurate will do well at this stat. But I don't think it measures everything else very well. In the same way, process maybe isn't great in passing grades. I think Process is certainly not great in CPOE. Sacks are ignored. Scrambles are ignored. All these other uh, types of plays that quarterbacks can make are ignored as part of this. So it is a great accuracy measure. And accuracy is something that is sticky season over season. It is something that there can be ups or downs in results more so than there are ups and downs in a quarterback's accuracy year over year. So that's why using it in conjunction with something like expected points added has been has been good. Uh, okay, let's get let's get to expected points added per play. What is it? Well, you have the context of down, distance, field position, exactly how many points are being added on every play that a quarterback is involved in. The upside of this, you're getting a real accurate measure of the exact value on these plays versus passing yards versus something like that. Even versus yards per play, yards per attempt, you don't really know situationally whether they were adding a lot of value there. So you're getting that with EPA per play. What you're not getting are adjustments for certain types of contextual situations. Is the offensive line awful? Are wide receivers generating a ton by being wide open? Are there drop passes? Are there dropped interceptions? All these things are not flowing into that type of metric. Uh, but I think knowing the value that you see there and then being able to make mental adjustments, knowing how these other things have played out, I think that's important. And that's why this is kind of like my gold standard metric is just to look at the EPA per play and then make some mental adjustments along with some of these others rather than sticking with something else that can be a little bit more opaque into exactly how it's being calculated. So the last one I'm going to hit here, ESPN's QBR, because this is an EPA based stat. ESPN's QBR is based on EPA, but there are adjustments. And I think most of the adjustments they make are logical. I think it's it's it helps contextually to try to go through this process, but the problem is it's opaque as to exactly what's happening. I saw a PowerPoint presentation from years ago where they broke down exactly what these adjustments are. And I can try to talk to you about some of the adjustments. So how do you get from e pure EPA per play to QBR? Well, the biggest one people will notice in QBR is that rushing value add through scrambling, through running the ball is allocated in a higher percentage to the quarterback than passing. The thought, and I think the thought is correct, is that a quarterback, if he runs and scrambles for a first down while the offensive line is doing something there, you know, the, the, the contribution from the rest of the team, from the offensive line, from the wide receivers, and so on and so forth, is just less than a play where he drops back to pass, is protected in the pocket, throws it out someone has to get open someone has to catch it someone runs after the catch all those different things with the quarterback never leaving the ball's hands he deserves to have a little bit more credit i think that makes sense so that's one of the adjustments there'll also be adjustments for yards after catch giving less credit to the quarterback than the value that's provided through air yards i think that's generally a good thing but on certain quarterbacks if they're playing in a way to maximize yards after catch, in particular by throwing it to the middle of the field, maybe someone like Jimmy Garoppolo, my, my boy, Jimmy Garoppolo, they might not get enough credit here. So they're going to be knocked for having more yard after the catch there. But I think generally that makes sense since it is a attribute that wide receivers can bring and a value that wide receivers can bring independent of the quarterback. 
to some degree. Uh, other adjustments you're going to see on there. They used to have a clutch adjustment. So depending upon how important a particular play was, they might get more or less. I believe that's been taken away. But they also have an adjustment where it's de-weighted, I believe still, if it's not that important of a play. So if you're up 30 nothing, your play at that point in time is not going to look that important and vice versa. If you're putting up a bunch of garbage time stats, you're not going to get that much in that circumstance. I like this in theory. Again, I think it's de-weighting it a little bit too much. I think you get information, you get signal from play almost down to about 1% win probability the way these teams play. So I think they're they're taking away probably a little bit too early how much value and win probability is being gained in some of these circumstances, and that can end up being a mistake in QBR. Uh, I think QBR generally might be the best measure of quarterback play, but again, for specific quarterbacks, there can be mistakes, and it has a 0 to 100 scale, which gives you an idea of how things are working, but it often doesn't align necessarily with our feelings about how these quarterbacks are and the fact that it is opaque makes it a little bit more difficult to, to dig into it so i guess what i would say generally when it comes to quarterback stats is that the best is a combination i love bringing together epa per play and pff passing grades because i think pff passing grades collect a lot of what is in an accuracy measure like cpoe um so having those two things together and then blending those is my favorite way of looking at things. Even for QBR, you could do QBR and passing grades, which I think come together there. You could try to blend together other ones. But generally, you want to take as many inputs as possible. No, but the most important thing is knowing the blind spots, knowing what's missing, knowing how they work in conjunction with each other. And then from there, trying to get the best idea you can of quarterback play, maybe with a little sprinkle of perception and how you feel differently than how the stats have played out for these quarterbacks. All right, before we get to our last segment here, our stick to sports segment, gentlemen, all men strive for gold in their life, right? Gold medals, gold watches, gold everything. However, there is a certain type of man who goes the extra mile. He walks with the confidence of an eagle and giggles in the face of danger. Not me we're talking about here. He's a big, hairless, winning machine, and he unzips his pants. He sees platinum. Okay, well, I don't know what that means. Uh, I don't know what, what sort of rings are going on down there. That's right, Manscaped would like to introduce you to their best and biggest ultimate hygiene bundle yet, the Platinum Package 4.0. Manscaped is the leader in below-the-waist grooming. Now trust them for the whole shebang. Join the 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by going to manscaped.com for 20% off and free shipping with code PFF. Manscaped's brand new Platinum Package 4.0 is the biggest bundle they have ever offered, giving you a bulk discount on Manscaped's top products. That's 20% off and free shipping with code PFF at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code PFF. It's time you enjoy the finer things in life and get yourself a platinum package for your platinum package. Okay, let's get to our last segment here, our stick to sports segment. Stick to sports, stick to sports. Stick to sports. Okay, this, there may be some sensitivity here. Uh, this is prompted by a discussion on these on the, on the Twitter streets, which eh, I got myself in a little bit. I wouldn't say hot water, but I got myself in like tepid, warm-ish sort of water. Uh, never will be canceled because I, I never go that far uh, on any of these things. And it was all in regards to having to weigh. I had to had to stick my beak in. I had to weigh my opinion in on some reaction to a story in Defector. For those who don't know, Defector, it's, I don't know what it is exactly. It's like the the new Deadspin. A lot of people used to work for Deadspin in the past and now started up with Defector. And it was an article from Laura Wagner over at Defector under the title, Under NYT Ownership, meaning New York Times Ownership, The Athletic, for those who don't know The Athletic, it is a collection of mostly of beat writers for a bunch of different sports, uh, started up a number of years ago, sold to The New York Times not too long ago, but The Athletic lays down no politics rule for staff. 
Now, I saw some reaction to this, people saying what it means, what it doesn't mean, this and this and that. I think what's important here is that Wagner is in the, she's not in the hard news business. She's in mostly the opinion business, I would say. She has some leaks here for what was said during some meetings. She has some, you know, snarky pretty much commentary on what is and what is going on here and that's her shtick you know she's 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 more of a incendiary kind of snarky writer it's funny if you agree with that sort of take if you don't agree with it you're probably just going to dismiss it and not really listen to it so a lot of this is is framed in my opinion in not the most generous manner towards the management of New York Times and The Athletic here. So I think what's important is to try to figure out like what does this actually mean for The Athletic and like this whole no politics thing, stick to sports, no politics. So I, you know, I weighed in, again, unfortunate of me to do so, and I couldn't help myself. And, you know, there's some pushback where I was saying that it wasn't as, basically it wasn't as, big of a deal as some people may thought since every media company really has this type of policy if you looked at the details it was not you can't ever you can't ever talk about politics it was framing it as you're not supposed to have like opinion based stuff when it comes to politics and that's really what it focuses on more and more so i want to address probably the three biggest disagreements that that i had here with people and why I believe that these are good policies. Maybe they're not perfect policies, but these are good policies that companies, media companies, including sports media companies have to limit somewhat what their reporters, their hard news reporters, not their opinion reporters, but their hard news reporters, their news reporters are doing on social media to try to wrangle that a bit to stay within a larger objective from an organization. Uh, before I get to those disagreements, I'm going to give you the exact wording of the athletics editorial guideline so you have that context of exactly what it is. So they have a section entitled political opinions, and it says journalists have no place on the playing fields of politics, even if those journalists cover sports, which increasingly intersects with politics. Staff members are entitled to vote, but they must do so, do nothing that might raise questions about their professional neutrality or that of, that of the athletic. In particular, the athletic staff members should not express their political beliefs on social media or any platform. I don't know what other platforms they're talking about, but on social media. I guess they mean like podcasting and stuff too. So, this, I get it why people read this and say what what their disagreements were for me. The disagreements that I uh, that I got from people for what for what should happen. And again, I think everyone is arguing in good faith. I think everyone is being sincere about their beliefs. They may not believe that about me in reverse, but you can't really like argue with someone to get them to believe that you're being sincere. If they're like, you're being disingenuous, you're like, no, no, I'm not, then they'll, you know, that that doesn't convince them. But I think good people. Sincere people can all have can have disagreements about these things. So the three dis main disagreements that that we got here. Number one was that sports journalists need to be able to talk about politics because of this intersection in sports and politics. Uh, number two was that these journalists cannot accurately talk about the reality of situations now with politics under these under these guidelines. And the third thing I got was. If you don't really, if you don't understand the the detriment of these policies, why these policies are bad, um, it's not because you have a difference of opinion. It's because you lack empathy, or you don't understand a certain situation, or you come from a certain perspective that is different than people who are more affected by politics, and therefore, you know, your opinions here, their opinion is is, is much much higher. So I'm going to address all all three of those. Those topics, and again, like I said, this is my opinion. I think everyone's coming at it from a uh, a sincere position, and when we discuss the facts and and go over it, I think we can come to some sort of understanding of each other. Because if there's any group of people who has a different opinion than you do about something, and you know there can be individuals 
who like argue things in bad faith or or kind of like psychopaths, evil, like actually really evil, want to cause evil in the world type of people. Those people can exist, but once you get a big enough group of people believing in something, then you have to acknowledge at a certain point that those people believe they're doing the right thing. Not that they're doing the right thing. They could be doing the wrong thing. They could be misguided. They could be misinformed. They could be biased. But they think they're doing the right thing. And if you can't get to that point, if you can't get to the point where you believe that these people think they're doing the right thing, then you simply, you just don't understand them. That's what it comes down to. And maybe you don't want to understand them. Maybe you prefer not to engage and understand them and you prefer, you know, coercion in some way instead, whether through the government or through, you know, social media or whoever, you prefer to do that than you would to try to understand someone and change their opinion. You know, that's, that's your prerogative. But the reality is you do not understand them if you do not understand that people have a different opinion for legitimate reasons, a group of people can have a different opinion for for legitimate reasons. Okay, let's get to the first point here and that is the uh, the the like stick to sports idea so sports journalists need to talk about politics. I agree. So I have no disagreement with people. And it seems like a weird thing to bring up because again, the Athletics editorial guideline talks about the fact that covering sports increasingly intersects with politics. And the reason you would have a social media policy that limits people talking about their beliefs and opinions about politics is not because that job doesn't involve politics, it's because it does involve politics. If you're concerned about the appearance of bias, if you're concerned about reporters making themselves kind of the, the political story, if you're concerned about the tendencies of social media to turn n news reporters who should be fair, who should be accurate, who should be measured. You know, social media turns, doesn't reward those things. It rewards bias. It rewards inflammatory statements. It rewards hyperbole, right? So the fact that you don't want reporters leaning into that when it has to do with politics is not because politics has nothing to do with sports, because politics does have to do with sports. So if you have a loss, a reputational loss, at least from a, one, some, some subset of your readers as to whether or not hard news reporters, not opinion reporters, hard news reporters can approach these subjects from a fair, accurate, and measured standpoint, if you lose that, that hurts companies that report on politics more than those that don't. And that's why The Athletic and other news organizations, sports news organizations want to have these policies. Not because they want to say never talk about politics, but they know you do have to talk about politics. So we don't want to give the impression that we're biased. We don't want to give the impression that we're using hyper hyperbole. We don't want to get the impression that we're using inflammatory sort of stuff. We want to give the impression, the same impression we would want to give in print to these ideas, to these political ideas, which are part of your job. Okay. There's no, so again, I don't think there's really a conflict there for that part. Now, the other thing is, you know, how can you talk accurately about politics under these guidelines? And the guidelines also were leaning into, you know, not blaming one particular party for this versus that. So a lot of this stuff, stuff was, well, how can you talk accurately about subject X without saying that most of the time people are weighing in this or saying the Republicans are causing X. And this brought me back to a social media, Twitter theory that I absolutely loved. It kind of didn't blow my mind, but it really just grabbed my mind with how accurate I thought it was in explaining the dynamics of social media. And this is from uh, ESPN's Bomani Jones. I believe this was on his Right Time podcast. Great podcast. Everyone should check it out. Um, he also had his Evening Jones podcast, which I'm not sure he's doing anymore, but that was maybe even a better podcast. That was a really excellent, excellent uh, Q&A type of podcast that he did there. So I'm not sure which one he talked about it on. I think it was Right Time. I think it was the same podcast that he's doing right now at ESPN, where 
his thing about social media, and I believe this is the quote, but I, again, this is a while back, so I'm I'm going off of memory here. Is he says, you're on social media either to inform or to perform. And the perform part, it sounds a little pejorative, but you know, it has that rhyming quality. So I think it works here. But I do think that is a big, big factor for how we view our social media presence. And I think about that a lot for my own social media presence. And it's not that all performance is bad. You know, comedy is great. Um, Opinions and takes can be great sometimes. But there's definitely a leaning towards the performing side of things. And every time you do something, it's some portion informing, it's some portion performing. Uh, And I always want to say, am I informing enough here? You know, I want that to be my thing is to be is to be an informing type of person rather than a performing type of person. Now, the third thing which I'm adding to his theory is conform, which is I do think people think they can use social media not just to inform, but then to influence and coerce people to conform conform to certain opinions. But again, I'm still fleshing out my theory there. Maybe I'll I'll write up a, a blog post on my anonymous blog somewhere just to discuss that. But I do think this inform perform distinction is important when we're talking about whether or not reporters can accurately talk about politics under these guidelines. In my opinion, you can still accurately talk about politics. You just have to lean heavily, heavily into informing, factual informing, as opposed to more of the performing stuff. So what do I mean by that? Um, What do I mean by that is that rather than saying Republicans are responsible for the lack of gun control in this country, I could see how people would say, you know, that's a pure 100% factual statement. So you should be able to say that. Well, it's, it's a simplification. Okay. It's not measured. It's not truly informing because you say that to the public and the public says, okay, I think I understand what you mean. I think I understand your thought process behind it. Some people, other people will say, I totally disagree with what you're saying, maybe, and and the thought process. And then even the people who agree with you, they don't know exactly what went into your, what went into your thought process. So the informing side of things, rather than saying, rather than saying that, and again, you know, there's like gun control measures that have been voted down by, um, by a uh, referendum, by public votes in places like Maine and other places where it's not like a party vote; it's just put up to public referendum, and it and it's and it loses sometimes. So there are there are a bunch of factors. It's more complex than that, essentially. Now, if you were to say the Republicans voted down gun control measures in this state and they voted in, 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 their, in their state Senate and they voted down in this state and they voted in that state. If you said that, if you just said, hey, here's a great article listing all the different ways that Republicans have voted down gun control, right? Rather than saying the Republicans are responsible for the lack of gun control in this country, which oversimplifies a bunch of different things. If instead you said, hey, look, here's this article with all these facts about what has happened, that would be informing people. That would not in any way be in violation of this policy that is talking about not talking about your beliefs or your opinions. Your beliefs, your opinions come into these simplifications that happen on social media. That's when they bleed through. And a big problem, I think, with how people view this is that people don't understand that Facts are different than beliefs. And we've gone into this era now, I think it's happened in journalism, it's happening in other places, where people say, my belief based upon these facts is so rock solid. In my mind, I can't see anyone coming to a different belief based upon these facts. I can't see it. So anyone who doesn't have these beliefs based upon these facts is either ill-informed or lying. So therefore, if it's impossible to see these facts and not come to this belief, then this belief is an is a fact. That's that's how the logic goes through here. And this is something that's been going on, you know, in in the the larger probably world and country for a while now is that people are less and less 
able to distinguish the difference between facts and opinions. Okay, there was a Pew Research Center study conducted in 2018 measuring Americans' ability to decipher facts from opinions. And 5,000 respondents here, they gave them five statements that were factual statements or framed as factual statements, five that were framed as opinions. And they asked them to, uh, you know, they're, they're identifying, is this, they're given these 10 statements, which one's fact and which one's opinion. You know, only a quarter of people were able to correctly identify all five of the facts and only about 35% were able to identify all five of the opinions correctly. So if you combine those two together, it was around 10% of the people were able to uh, identify them all. And they, they told you here a factual statement. This is their definition for a factual statement. And this is something that I agree with. And I don't think a lot of people agree anymore. This is what a fact is. It says a factual statement, regardless of whether it was accurate or inaccurate. This is like for, for, for the for, for the, the study here. So forget the inaccurate or inaccurate part. But it says um, they thought the statement could be proved or disproved based upon objective evidence. So they're, they're calling something a factual statement, not whether it's right or not, but whether it's the type of statement that can be definitively proved or disproved based on uh, objective evidence. And an opinion is something that cannot be definitively proved or disproved. I, I believe in that same thing, but a lot of people, they look at particular statements and some of the statements that were on here, I'll, I'll give you some of them that, that they were given here. Like one of them says, immigrants who were in the US illegally are a big problem for the country today. You know, over 50% of Republicans said that as a factual statement. And I see how they could get to it, right? They could say, uh, immigration takes away, illegal immigration takes this away, takes that away, it lowers wages, it's using up, you know, whatever health insurance, it's doing this, doing that. Therefore, there's no way you can say it's not a problem for the country. Like that's a fact. That's A to B going over the fact. The same way you can say the Republicans voted for this, this, and that. So therefore, they hate this group of people. You know, again, get those particular things, facts that go into it, you can definitively say. You cannot definitively say the other thing. You're imputing motive and you're oversimplifying things. It cannot be definitively proven. A belief cannot be definitively proven. It's not two plus two equals four. So that's happening more and more. A similar sort of study in the Program for International Student Assessment found that less than 10% of 15-year-olds that they've been assessing, and this has been going down over time, could correctly tell the difference between opinion and fact also. And they found that mostly it was the opinions that people thought were facts if they aligned with their political opinions. That was the biggest problem here. And I think this is what we're seeing here is that people think that these opinions, these beliefs that they're sharing on social media are facts. And that's why they should be able to, to put them out there. That's why there's not a misalignment with doing hard, factual journalism. But again, I just don't think there's, that mis there's really that problem. If you want to discuss facts, if you want to share an article about what's going on on a particular political topic with facts, with info. You want to inform people. You are still able to do that. If you want to make a inflammatory, generalizing statement and do more performing than informing, that's when it becomes a problem. And I do think that's something that should be discouraged for news organizations that want to inform the public, that are not in the performance business. At least their, their op-ed columnists are not in the performance business. And the last thing I'll say on this subject, again, I'm going on a rant here for, for a little bit long here, but I think something important, something I think about a lot, is that the last part of pushback that I got was, you know, you kind of lack empathy for certain people that you don't understand. And it comes down to, you know, sexual orientation, race, other things, uh, sex, you know, me being a white dude uh, of, of fairly well means, not poor by any stretch, that I can't empathize with other people. I am sensitive to that argument. I understand that. I think about it. I take it in. Um, there's not just a bunch of people, you know, rubbing their hands together saying, uh, how can we, how can we hold down these other, these other groups, you know? Um, but what I'll also say is that I think the divide here is much more 
again, showing how like this fact opinion based thing has been changing over time and getting worse and worse, or, or having a different definition of what a fact is over time. I think it's much more generational and whether you are kind of management versus an individual, then it is an identity-based thing. I mean, let's look at the New York Times just generally. Um, if you want to say, I can't empathize because I'm not, you know, I can't empathize with racism because of who I am. Well, for the New York Times, the the executive editor who is stepping down because he hit his, uh, they have an age limit, believe it or not, the New York Times for executive editor, uh, Dean Bacay, who is stepping down, He'd been there for a while, was there through all of the social media policy, everything else that was implemented there. Um, Dean Bacay is a black man who grew up in the Jim Crow South of New Orleans, in the Seventh Ward of New Orleans, who reported for many, many years for the Times Picune down there, the, uh, the, the main paper of New Orleans, who has parents who had a, you know, had a little restaurant down in that area and also were helped work as community organizers against segregation and racism down there in that area. Now, I agree that you can tell me that I may not be able to empathize with those sort of things, but it gets harder when you do have other people. Not everyone shares a certain view within a certain identity group. You do have other people. You have Dean Bacay who made these policies. Just tell someone who grew up in the Jim Crow South that he doesn't understand racism as well as you do, and that's why he has the wrong opinion for what these policies should be. It gets more complicated th than that. You can't fully discount one opinion or fully elevate another opinion based upon just these, these factors outside of it. And again, I think it is very, very much generational. I think younger people grew up in social media. They understand that they are a presence. They are a brand on these different platforms. They believe that not speaking out on a subject is basically working against the activism of something, is being against something. Not being able to really forcefully talk about something is shirking their duty to do something good. And I, I think they're sincere in wanting to do that. Um, but it's just a different perspective. And it just doesn't comport best with being a fact-based journalist. And you have to weigh the interests of the individual, the reporters in this circumstance. And of course, like an individual reporter is not gonna wanna restrict their own, is gonna be against restricting anything that they can do on social media versus the, the institution. So people in management and others are going to think about those things more. So I don't expect individual reporters to you know, say, yes, sir, let's go, you know, restrict what I can do on here. But I do think for the good of the institution, people are trying to make the right decision, the well-intentioned decision to help things out. Okay, so that is really my basic thing here. And I would say for everyone out there, try to think about people in good faith, try to think about other groups of people as thinking they're doing the right thing, even if they're misinformed, even if they're misguided, even if they're very, very harmful results of what they're doing. And then that would be the way to understand and move forward. And also on social media, everyone let's try to inform a little bit more. And I think we can avoid a lot of the problems and the misdiagnosis and the inflammatory, unmeasured, bias sort of stuff that quite f frequently lends grist to those who want to undermine the validity of our institutions, including major mass media that, you know, I, I for one, I know that they mess up all the time, but I for one still believe in and still pe believe people are trying to do the right thing. Okay, everyone, that was a huge rant there. Uh, if any of you are still tuning in, congratulations to you. I give you major props here. I'm going to come to you later this week talking to Michael Lopez, who is the director of data and analytics at the NFL. We're going to talk big data bowl. We're going to talk about all the different uh, initiatives that he has going on at the NFL. We're going to talk a little bit about the Sloan Sports Conference, and he was quoted about being a little bit out of touch there with how much money they're charging and how they've set up the conference there. And that'll be an interesting discussion. All that and more later on this week. Until then, I'll be talking at you all later. Thanks so much for tuning in. <laughs>